Okay, well, many thanks for that very nice introduction and, and thank you all for coming. And I can just say it's, it's a huge honour to be here and uh, quite inspiring to speak in a room surrounded by all these uh, giants of, uh, of biology. And um, it's, a really, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk with you today. Um, I'm going to tell you about Tasmanian devils and in particular um, the fact that they get transmissible cancers. I'm going to tell you a bit about transmissible cancers. And um, in the end, I'm going to tell you about a very, very surprising finding that we've made recently, that there are, in fact, two transmissible cancers in this species. OK, so I think it's quite fitting to start a lecture here by talking about evolution. Um, when we think of evolution and natural selection, we often think about species and uh, uh, the evolution of, of species. But actually, cancer is also an evolutionary process. Um, cancer occurs when a normal cell, which is illustrated here, becomes a cancer cell, which is shown here, when it acquires a set of mutations known as somatic mutations, which cause that cancer cell to enter a state of proliferative autonomy. So once the cell becomes a cancer cell, it actually starts undergoing an evolutionary process. It starts being acted upon by natural selection, but rather than acting at the level of the organism, uh, natural selection is actually acting at the level of the cell. These cells, cancer cells, are competing with each other. So here, this is illustrating these cancer cells competing with each other within this particular cancer here. And we can see, for instance, here's a, here's a cell here which has gained advantage, has been selected for. So this has been successful. Maybe it's acquired mutations which have helped it to divide more quickly or helped it to uh, build a blood supply more quickly. And there's other cells shown in black here which have died out. They've been less successful. So each cancer uh, originating in each individual is, in fact, driven by evolution and is its own unique evolutionary process. So it will have its own unique set of mutations and biological pathways which got it to this state of being a cancer. However, the important fact that I wanted to bring to your attention is the fact that cancer is usually an evolutionary dead end. So it starts when one of the cells in our body goes wrong, gets mutations and starts evolving in a selfish manner and producing more copies of itself. But actually the continued growth and invasion of that cancer and it's spreading through the body through the process of metastasis, that can often lead to the death of the host and therefore also to the death of the cancer. So cancer is kind of paradoxical because it, it grows and arises, but actually it causes its own demise. It's an evolutionary dead end. Our research, on the other hand, is on cancers where this is not the case. These are transmissible cancers which are able to survive beyond the deaths of the original host that first gave rise to them by the transplantation of cancer cells between hosts. So this is shown here. A cancer arises in the normal way from a single cell in one individual. It, uh, it evolves, it becomes a cancer. But then rather than dying together with its host as would normally happen, in transmissible cancers, cancer cells are actually physically transplanted from one host into another host, allowing the continued survival of this cancer even long after the death of this original host that first gave rise to the cancer. So this cancer over here, although it's growing in a different individual, it actually carries all the genetic material from this original individual that first gave rise to that cancer. So this type of disease, transmissible cancer, is very rare in nature. Uh, in fact, until very recently, and I'll come back to this later, until recently we've only known of two examples in the whole of nature. Uh, one in Tasmanian devils, known as Tasmanian devil facial tumour disease, or DFTD, which I'll tell you more about today. And the other is the canine transmissible venereal tumour. Um, it's a, a transmissible cancer that affects dogs. Actually, my laboratory in Cambridge, um, half of it studies this cancer, and it's absolutely fascinating. I wish I could tell you more about it today. Not least because actually this cancer first arose in an individual dog that lived about 11,000 years ago. Um, and so that dog got a cancer 11,000 years ago. That cancer has taken on a life of its own by jumping into other dogs. And now actually this dog cancer has spread all around the world and is in fact the oldest and most widespread cancer that we know of in nature. It's sexually transmitted, it causes genital tumours. I've chopped off the tumour here because I wanted to spare you that um, nasty picture, but um, 
biologically, it's extraordinarily fascinating. But today I'm going to tell you about uh, the Tasmanian devils and the predicament they're in with their transmissible cancer. So let's start off by talking a bit about Tasmanian devils. It was really, really lovely to see the, um, the display you have upstairs uh, of Tasmanian devils and also of Tasmanian tigers. And I'd really uh, encourage you to go and have a look at that if you have a chance. Um, so Tasmanian devils are in fact um, the world's largest carnivorous marsupial. They gained that, um, um, that, uh, that status after the demise of the Tasmanian tiger, which went extinct um, about 60 years ago or so. So the Tasmanian devil um, is a nocturnal carrion eater. Uh, they're mostly scavengers. They, they go out at night. They're very shy. Uh, I'm, I'm actually from Tasmania, as you mentioned, and it, it's quite rare to see them in the wild um, uh, because they tend to stay away from people and to be quite, um, yeah, quite secretive. Um, however, uh, in Tasmania, you can hear their screaming sound that they make, which I'll play for you in a minute, which is actually kind of part of the reason they got this name, the devil. Uh, I think the other reason they got the name, the devil, is the fact that they have these very large and strong jaws, which they use for chomping on bones and um, uh, tissues. And I mean, they, they basically eat the entire carcass that they come across, and they, they eat it all using these, um, these incredibly strong jaws, which are actually the strongest jaws per body mass uh, of any mammal, I think. Um, so Tasmanian devils used to be actually widespread across all of the Australian continent, um, but they went extinct in mainland Australia about a few thousand years ago, so between 3,000 and 5,000 years ago, um, probably partly because of the introduction of the dingo, which is a competitor. Um, and so they became... Um, um, only found in, in Tasmania, which is this island just down here uh, to the south of mainland Australia. It looks very small on this map, but it's about the size of the Republic of Ireland. So Tasmanian devils being marsupials, they give birth to very tiny, underdeveloped young. Uh, this picture here is actually showing four Tasmanian devil babies as they look when they're born. Uh, as you can see, this is a coin here. So they're, they're really absolutely tiny. They're about the size of a grain of rice. And actually, the mother doesn't even really notice when she gives birth, because the young just crawl out of the birth canal and crawl into the pouch, and they complete their development in the pouch. Another very interesting feature of Tasmanian devils uh, for natural history people is uh, actually they give birth to about 40, 30 to 40 young. Um, however, there are only four uh, teats in the pouch. And so um, basically it's the survival of the fastest. Those that get into the, into the pouch first and find the teats are the ones that survive and the other ones just don't make it. So uh, normally when we think about pouches, we think about um, kangaroos, um, uh, which have upward-facing pocket-like pouches where the young can kind of develop. Tasmanian devils, on the other hand, have downward-facing pouches. It's basically a fold of skin um, on, their, on their belly. And after some time, the young just become a bit too big and start falling out. Um, so they usually have about four young, and you can see they're starting to fall out here. And then the mother builds a den. So this is when the young are about four or five months of age. And then she goes out hunting and scavenging by night, and she would come back during the day to feed the young. Um, and when they're about nine or ten months of age, the young simply disperse from the mother. And after that, they become very solitary. And they don't tend to interact with each other at all, really. They, they don't have territories. They just kind of roam around. Um, and if they meet each other, they tend to behave a bit like this. They tend to bite each other a lot, um, particularly around the face. So you can see, for instance, this animal here He's lost a lot of the fur around his jaws. That's probably because he's, re he's received so many bites that he's, uh, he's got a lot of scar tissue around there. And this is when they scream and fight. And um, here's just a little video to illustrate just how they behave. <laughs> Yeah, 
So then you can see how they got their name. And you can also see how they bite each other and they have this kind of jaw locking thing where they, they bite each other and lock jaws and they can really injure each other quite a lot. Um, but with humans, they're actually surprisingly docile. Um, this is actually uh, how we trap the devils in the wild. Um, so basically it's, it's, it's kind of a pipe um, with a little piece of bait at the back attached to a piece of string which is attached to this uh, trap door. So the devils would go into the, the trap and uh, pull down the bait and that closes the trap door. And after that, they just kind of usually settle down and fall asleep. And the next morning when we researchers go around to the traps, um, if there's a devil in there, they're usually very calm. They're usually just lying there. And actually, they don't tend to struggle. And if you kind of handle them very gently, you can actually take pieces of tissue from their tumors, et cetera, without them needing any anesthetic. Um, they're, they're, they very rarely uh, bite or behave aggressively towards humans. It's quite interesting. Um, and in fact, they are very adorable. Um, this is a young devil that we trapped who was probably just dispersing from his mother for the first time. And when they're young, they're, they've got this beautiful face and, and uh, they're really just so unique because they, yeah, they're, they're one of the most amazing animals, I think, um, in the world. But sadly, they're, they're, this species is really in danger now, um, in fact, in danger of extinction due to the emergence of this uh, disease, um, this transmissible cancer. So let me tell you a bit more about that now. So the story of the disease began um, about 20 years ago in 1996 when a wildlife photographer took this photograph of a devil with a large tumor on its face. So you can see this is just a devil here, it's eating something there, and you can see this massive growth on its cheek. So this in itself w wasn't that, that concerning because it, obviously animals sometimes get strange growths and tumors just like humans do. Um, so seeing this was, was a bit strange, but it wasn't really cause for a huge amount of alarm. That photograph was taken up here in 1996 in the northeast of Tasmania. But what was alarming that in subsequent years, um, there were more sightings of devils with facial tumors. Each of the red dots represents one sighting. And you can see over the years, by the early 2000s, there had been quite a number of sightings of devils with kind of strange growths around their face. Um, and it wasn't really until around 2003 or 2004 when it became very clear that this was actually a new type of infectious disease that was spreading through the devil population, causing these tumors. But unfortunately, by that time, it was really too late to try to stop the disease um, by building a, a fence or something like that because it had already spread very far. And as a result, the disease has just really continued to spread. And now in 2017, the current state of affairs is that the disease has spread through almost all of Tasmania. Um, the main areas, in fact, the only area that is confirmed to be disease-free is this corner of Tasmania up here in the northwest. But the disease is moving up there um, at a steady pace, and there's concern that the, the disease will probably reach there in the next few years. And at the same time, there have been massive declines in devil populations in eastern Tasmania, more than 95% in some populations, uh, similar all up and down this eastern part of Tasmania. <coughs> so at this rate of population decline and disease spread, there's concern that the species could go extinct in the wild within only a matter of, of decades. So it's really a big conservation problem. So I wanted to tell you a bit more about the disease. Um, what is this disease? Well, it was given the name in the early 2000s, Tasmanian Devil Fatal Tumor Disease, or DFTD for short. And it was described as a disease that leads to the appearance of tumors on the face or inside the mouth of affected Tasmanian devils. Um, this is a very typical case here. So you can see these large ulcerating tumors uh, on, on the face of this animal. So these tumors usually start as fairly small nodules um, and then they rapidly progress into being these large uh, ulcerated masses that you can see here. 
And they frequently metastasize, which means they spread to different parts of the body, um, and they usually kill the devils within a few months of the appearance of symptoms. Uh, at present, there's no um, cure or prevention that we have. Um, so sadly, when you have a devil like this, it's really most likely going to die very soon. If you stick a needle into one of these tumors and aspirate some cells, and then look at them under the microscope, staining for a, uh, with a blue stain that makes the nucleus um, blue, you can see that these tumors are composed of these round cells, uh, which are very undifferentiated. So they don't give very many clues about what type of cells they are. Um, and if you take a piece of, uh, of tissue from this tumor and prepare it in a way that stains it for contrast, uh, you can see that these tumors are composed of these um, fairly small cells, um, which are very bundled together. So they're kind of growing on top of each other, which is one of the things that you often see in cancer. Um, and you can see that, the, the, so the cancer cells are the blue ones. They are kind of forming these kind of bundle-like structures, which is also fairly typical of this type of cancer. Not all cancers are like that, but this, this cancer tends to form these bundle structures. And importantly, um, DFTD cancer is, um, expresses a particular gene called PRX, uh, which is stained brown in, in this picture here. And this is an important marker which helps um, pathologists to diagnose the disease. So after DFTD was observed and, and it was found to be infectious and was spreading through Tasmania, the immediate thought that sprang into everybody's mind was that this is probably likely to be a virus because we all know of viruses that can cause cancer. Um, and so a search was launched kind of in the early 2000s to try to find the virus which was causing this particular cancer in devils. Um, and it wasn't really until a breakthrough came uh, from people studying chromosomes that people started to realize that this is actually not likely to be a virus in the end at all. So this was work, the breakthrough was work by, uh, by two colleagues in Tasmania, Anne-Marie Pierce and Kate Swift, who were studying devil chromosomes. So devils have fairly simple chromosomes. They only have seven pairs of chromosomes, um, which are shown here. And this is a normal uh, male devil. You can see the X and the Y chromosome over here. They looked at DFTD chromosomes and they found that DFTD had a very unusual set of chromosomes. So you can see, for instance, uh, both sets of chromosome two appear to be missing. There don't seem to be any X or Y chromosomes there. There's only one copy of chromosome six. Over here, we have these things called M chromosomes, which are basically unidentified chromosomes. They don't really look like anything in the normal devil. And so basically, this, this, is, this wasn't really very surprising, actually, because um, most cancers have strange changes in their chromosomes. Um, in fact, what happens during cancer evolution is often chromosomes get broken apart and put back together in different ways, and all sorts of strange things happen. There are extra chromosomes and pieces of tiny chromosome. So this wasn't very surprising. In fact, it was expected that a cancer would have a very strange set of chromosomes. However, what was really surprising was that all of the tumors from different Tasmanian devils from different parts of Tasmania they all had uh, pretty much identical changes in their chromosomes. So we can see this very unusual looking chromosome that I showed you before, one of the M chromosomes. Here it is, it's present in all of these different individual tumors. And it wasn't just four, it was actually dozens. Now it's hundreds um, of, of tumors which all carry pretty much identical changes. And this was extraordinarily surprising because in cancer, when these changes come about, they arise in a slightly random way, so that the DNA breaks in a kind of random place and then the machi repair machinery puts it back together in a different way. And so if you look at any cancer, any human cancer, for instance, each of them will have its own unique uh, chromosomal configuration. And the fact that all of these had identical chromosome configurations, which were also very complex, really suggested that rather than these tumors originating independently from their own host cells, as usual cancers do, it seemed more likely that this cancer actually arose from one original Tasmanian devil and then spread to other devils by the transmission of living cancer cells. And so that raises the question, how would this cancer be spread? 
And that comes back to this um, picture that I showed you before of the way the devils tend to behave when they are um, meeting each other and uh, uh, engaging in fighting behavior. They tend to bite each other, particularly around the face. And so the idea that we have at the moment is that these tumors, they grow around the face or inside the mouth, and tumor cells actually get sloughed off the, the, the tumor, and they get associated with the teeth. Um, and then when that devil goes and bites another devil, it actually injects those cancer cells into the next host. And rather than, rather than, being, rather than being rejected by the immune system, which would normally happen uh, when you have a piece of foreign tissue being implanted, uh, that somehow doesn't happen. And rather, this tumor grows into a new uh, tumor in the next devil. So when I first started uh, working on this, I was keen to confirm this theory using genetics. So if a devil's cancer is really spread by living cancer cells, then we would expect that all the tumors should be genetically similar to each other, because they're actually one single tumor. And we would expect that all the tumors should be genetically unmatched with their hosts. So if we were to take some tissues from this devil's normal tissues and from his tumor tissue and compare them to each other, we should expect to find that they are genetically unmatched, just like you and the person next to you are genetically unmatched, because you're different individuals. This tumor arose in a different individual and actually belongs to a different individual. So we put this to the test um, using what's called microsatellite genotyping. Um, microsatellites, for those of you who are not geneticists, are um, uh, simple uh, DNA repeats which are found in the genome. So this is an example here, G A G A G A G A G A, and it's repeated 200 to 300 times. Um, these types of microsatellite repeats are found in all genomes, including humans, um, and all, basically all all animal and plant genomes have them. Um, they don't really seem to have an, a function particularly but they are very useful for geneticists because they tend to mutate very fast. And that's because when this DNA gets replicated, because it's so repetitive, often the, the machinery that replicates the DNA can get a bit lost and introduce an extra GA or delete a GA. And so that would change the length of this tract here. And so this is useful because if you look across a panel of these across a population, you would expect that each individ individual will have its unique fingerprint of of microsatellite alleles. In fact, this is what uh, police use in forensics. They tend to use microsatellites because they're so variable across the population, and no two individuals would likely to be the same. So it seems like an ideal uh, tool to use in, in this case to identify the tumor. So what I'm going to show you is some data that we generated from nine different microsatellite loci. So each of these letters here represents a particular locus, which means one particular part of the genome con containing uh, a microsatellite. And each of these um, uh, uh, loci has a number of different alleles, which means different sized tracts in different individuals. And what I've done is color them in different colors. So here at locus L, we have um, two different alleles in the population, one's 190, one's 194. Here at locus E, we have three different alleles that we found. These are the sizes of them, etc. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of how the data look, um, this is just uh, a representation of a normal devil. And he's diploid, so he's got two copies. And you can see with the colors that he's heterozygous here, he's heterozygous here, he's homozygous for the blue one here, he's heterozygous here, etc. So now let's look at the tumors. So when we looked at, the, at four different DFTD tumors collected from different places, um, you can see immediately that they're all the same. So they are identical at every single locus, indicating really quite clearly that they must belong to the same individual. You just wouldn't expect to find that by chance. And importantly, uh, all of these tumors were genetically different in every case from the host in which they were derived. So it confirms that these tumors didn't arise from the cells of their, their hosts, but rather they belong to one original devil, which we call the DFTD founder devil, that devil got a cancer um, probably more than 20 years ago. Um, the, its cells grew into a tumor. Somehow that spread into another devil. From there, it spread to more devils. And from there, this single cancer has spread all through Tasmania. So when we look at these cancer cells that I showed you before, uh, under the microscope, we're looking at a pretty extraordinary, extraordinary biological entity. Because not only is this a cancer, 
But this is also an infectious disease. And it's, only, it's also the only uh, cancer that we know of that's actually threatening a species with extinction. So I wonder what Darwin would have made of this, whether he would have thought that this is a species in its own right or if it's uh, actually a Tasmanian devil. It's a little bit hard to define. So with this really bizarre cancer, it's able to do all sorts of things that perhaps normal cancers wouldn't be able to do. For instance, it's able to transmit between individuals and it's able to escape the immune system despite being a foreign graft in its host. And all the information that allows this cancer to do this must be contained within its DNA, within its genome, which is stained blue in, in this picture here. And so quite a few years ago now, I became very interested in understanding just how this cancer works and how it became this cancer and how it has evolved and is continuing to evolve by sequencing its DNA. And that's really what brought me to the, to the UK um, back in 2009 uh, with a fellowship to, to sequence the DNA or to sequence the entire genome from this cancer. But before we could really get started on that, we needed to develop a few tools for understanding Tasmanian devils more generally. Uh, at that time, back in 2009, um, there was the human genome, and there was a mouse genome, there were a few other genomes, but there was no Tasmanian devil genome, which we really needed to try to understand what was going on here. So we were lucky enough to be at a time and at a place to actually go about sequencing the entire Tasmanian devil genome from scratch. And I'm not going to really tell you much about that, other than telling you that uh, we selected one particular Tasmanian devil for sequencing. Uh, she, her name was Salem from Taronga Zoo in Sydney. Uh, we took her cells and we sheared the, her DNA into very small pieces. That's important because um, the DNA sequencing technologies that we have access to, they can only sequence tiny pieces of DNA rather than large pieces, so they're small pieces. And then you sequence them all individually. And then the really challenging part is to assemble them. So basically take all these small pieces and use the sequence information to put them all back together to build chromosomes. It's quite a computationally uh, difficult task. But we managed to do it in a, in a couple of years. And um, then we worked with uh, colleagues uh, such as the ensemble team. Basically what those people do is to take DNA sequences, which are just huge strings of A's, C's, G's, and T's. And then they use information uh, from other genomes and knowledge that we have about genes to try to find where the genes are within that genome. So this is called the genome annotation. Um, and that's important because, of course, we want to know which genes are mutated, etc. So at the end of all that, we had a genome for the Tasmanian devil, uh, which is actually about the same size as the human genome, um, with about 20,000 genes, which is about similar to the human genome as well. So the next step was to sequence DFDD, which is what my original goal had been. This is actually much, much simpler than sequencing the Tasmanian devil genome, because all you have to do now is to take um, DNA from DFTD, again, shear it up into small pieces, because that's what goes into our machine. And then the machine will chug away for about two weeks and then spit out a whole lot of uh, short sequences of DNA. This time, rather than putting them all back together again, which is the challenging part, all we have to do is just align them to the reference genome, which we produced over here, which is computationally much more straightforward. So here we have, for instance, a short read mapping here, another short read mapping here, etc. And then the exciting part is to find out where the mutations are, what's the difference between uh, the normal and the cancer. So here, for instance, we have a what is it, a C in the reference, and then we have an A over here in the, in the cancer, so potentially it's a cancer mutation. Um, so basically what we did was kind of go through the DFTD genome and search for mutations using this method. But before I tell you about what we found, I wanted to, first of all, discuss something very important, which is going to come up throughout the talk um, when it comes to genetics of DFTD. So there's something quite special going on here. If we sequence, for instance, if we select a tumour from one particular Tasmanian devil and sequence its DNA, if you think about it, what we're actually sequencing here when we compare it to the reference genome is actually the genome of this original devil, um, the DFTD founder devil. And we're finding all of the genetic variation that that devil had in that devil's genome, which made it different to other devils in the population. On top of that, we're sequencing all the so-called somatic mutations which arose 
during the evolution of this cancer uh, as, a, as, a, as a cancerous clone, so after it left its, its original host, as it spread through the population, going through all these different transient hosts right up to this particular tumor that we sequenced here. So when we sequence the DFTD genome, we actually have access to two types of different, two different types of genetic variation. Germline variation, which is the variation that this devil originally had and inherited and is present in the population. And that can tell us more about what type of individual this was, why this particular individual might have got this cancer, etc. And then the somatic mutation. So these are the mutations which arose during the time that this cancer has been a cancer. Uh, so they can tell us about what caused this cancer in the first place and also perhaps how it's evolved and spread. So I'm going to briefly tell you about how we found out a little bit more about this original devil and the cancer evolution by looking at germline and somatic mutations. So let's start with this original devil. So one very simple question we wanted to answer was what was the gender of this devil? Was it a female or was it a male? Okay, that seems like a simple question, but when you go back to this uh, picture I showed you before, if you remember, there wasn't any evidence for any sex chromosomes in, uh, in this cancer uh, karyotype. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that there is no sex chromosome DNA, because it's quite likely that the sex chromosome DNA got rearranged, and so it's not obvious from this type of analysis, but it would be obvious from a, from a molecular analysis. So what we did was to identify in our genome the SRY gene, which is actually the gene which causes maleness, um, and it's very conserved throughout mammals. And we designed um, uh, a test for looking at this SRY gene and screened it in, in DFTD. So here's the result of that test. So here's a female devil, and we can see there's no little band there, whereas the male devil is, is present because he's a male. And you can see that it's also absent from DFTD. So it seems clear from this that DFTD doesn't have this SRY gene. It still doesn't absolutely prove that the original devil was actually a female, though, because there's two possibilities. First, the original devil was a female that had two X chromosomes, and that's what we're finding in the cancer over here. Alternatively, it's possible that the original devil was a male who inherited an X and a Y, but during cancer evolution, the Y chromosome here got lost. And that actually occurs quite frequently in cancer. In fact, the Y chromosome loss is one of the most common occurrences that's found in cancer. So that didn't seem so unlikely. So what we did was to turn to our genome sequences to try to determine which of these is more likely to be the case by looking at the copy number of the X. Basically, we wanted to know, is there one X there or are there two Xs there? So what I'm showing you now is a whole genome sequencing plot um, that we generated by sequencing a female devil and a male devil. And basically what, what this is showing is the different chromosomes lined up here, chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and X over here. And each of the little red dots is actually a, a, a bin of the genome, part of the genome, representing how many copies there are of that little part of the genome. So each little red dot is one little part of the genome. And if you look, uh, if you look at a large scale, you can, I mean, the most important thing to see here is that across the genome in a female devil, all of the chromosomes are pretty much present in the same, at the same level, including the X. Whereas in a male, you have the same copy of all of these chromosomes, but only one X. So that's the most important thing here. When we look at DFTD, the first thing we can see is there's a couple of kind of weird things happening. So here there's a couple of extra pieces of, this, of chromosome four and there's a little loss here on chromosome six, sorry, five. So that actually is not that surprising because again, cancers often kind of lose or gain pieces of chromosome. But what we were interested in from this perspective was understanding how many copies there are of the X. And it's very clear from this analysis uh, that there are two copies of the X, just like a female devil. So we believe that this original devil was probably a female and we are trying to come up with a name for this animal. If you have any ideas, uh, let me know after the talk. Okay, so we figured out using genetics that the original animal was probably a female. Um, what about the somatic mutations? Um, we wanted to know, of course, uh, how many somatic mutations there are. And that's an interesting question. It's actually a difficult one to answer. And I wanted to, first of all, give you a little bit of perspective by introducing you to how many mutations are generally found in human cancers. So this is just a plot here from a recent paper. 
showing the numbers of mutations in various types of human cancers. Um, and each of the little black dots represents one individual tumor from one person, and the red line represents the average number of mutations in that cancer. And this is a log scale here. So uh, this, it goes from kind of 10 or so mutations to about 100,000 mutations up here. And what you can see is there's a massive range in different numbers of mutations across different human cancers, which is quite interesting. And it's particularly interesting when you look at what types of cancers, uh, wh how many mutations different types of cancers have. So down here, at the bottom end of the scale, with not very many mutations, are childhood cancers um, and leukemias. So childhood brain cancers and leukemias, they don't tend to have very many mutations. Whereas up here on the other end of the scale, there are cancers which have been chronically exposed to carcinogens. So right at the top here, there's melanoma, uh, which is usually caused by exposure to UV, ultraviolet from the sun, which causes a lot of mutations. There's also lung cancer up here, which is uh, associated with, with smoking. And these mutations are, due to, are largely due to exposure to cigarette smoke. So we wanted to know, how does DFTD fit into this spectrum here? How many mutations does it have? That is actually not such an easy question to answer in the end, because we don't actually have any normal DNA from the original devil that first gave rise to DFTD. So what we decided to do was to sequence the complete genomes of two different DFTD tumors from totally different parts of Tasmania, shown here, and search for mutations in both of these two tumors, with the idea that if we find a mutation in this tumor which is not present in that tumor, it's likely to be a somatic mutation because this is a cancer which arose from one original cancer, if you see what I mean. So we did this and we found that each of these two tumors had around 2,000 mutations each. So just displaying that in a different way, we can say that these two tumors that from different parts of Tasmania has each acquired about 2,000 mutations since they diverged from this most recent common ancestor tumor back here. So that means that DFTD, at least based on this analysis, is somewhere around this lower end of the range in terms of number of mutations, uh, which is quite interesting and suggests that chronic exposure to carcinogens hasn't probably been a part of the evolution of, of DFTD. Um, but perhaps the most interesting question when it comes to mutations is not how many mutations there are, but rather which mutations actually caused this cancer in the first place. And perhaps you'll be very surprised to learn that actually of these thousands or hundreds of thousands of mutations that are generally found in cancer, only about four of them are actually required to cause the cancer in the first place. So very, very small number of these are actually important. The rest of them are simply neutral in terms of evolution. They don't have any impact whatsoever. So we wanted to know in the devil cancer which mutations actually cause this cancer. And importantly, we wanted to know how does this cancer escape from the immune system? Maybe it needs even more mutations to help it to escape the immune system and to become transmissible. In other words, we wanted to find the mutations which occurred all the way back here. Because presumably the, the mutations that cause this cancer probably arose in the original devil or shortly after it, the cancer left that original devil. So that's actually quite challenging as well, because when we have mutations which, are, which occurred back here, they would have to be present in all of the tumors. And so because we don't have any DNA from this normal devil back here, it's impossible for us to know which variant, which genetic variant is, was originally inherited in this animal versus how many mutations there are. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of perspective, if you were to compare your genome with the person next to you, you'd probably find about three million differences. If you compare one devil to another devil, you probably find about one million differences because they are more genetically related than we are. However, we're searching for probably in the order of a few thousand maximum somatic mutations back here. So when we find any genetic variant in DFTD, it's very, very likely that it's going to be germline and originally present in that devil rather than a mutation, which are the ones we're interested in. So how are we going to find out which mutations actually cause, which are the important four or so mutations which actually cause this cancer? So what we decided to do was to turn to um, a database that 
uh, people have developed in human oncology um, looking at genes which have been found to be causatively involved in cancer in humans. And actually there's a list of, well it's actually gone up now, there's about 600 or so genes which are known to be causatively involved in human cancer. That doesn't mean to say that all of them are mutated in human cancer, usually only about four are in each cancer, but there's a list of 600 or so uh, which have been found to be causatively involved in at least one cancer. We also curated a set of genes that are involved in the immune system uh, because we're particularly interested in how this cancer might escape the immune system. And we took this list of, of, uh, of interesting genes and we screened them across uh, the DFTDs that we had sequenced, um, hoping to potentially find mutations in exactly the same places as found in human cancers and therefore possible candidates for being causative in this case. But unfortunately, our screen so far has shown up zero uh, mutations uh, in any of these cancer-causing genes that are common to all of the DFTDs that we've looked at, which is a bit of a conundrum. Um, and it raises the question, could maybe Tasmanian devils have different genes uh, which are uh, different to human cancers, and so they're not on our list here? It's possible. But also a very interesting thing is that some human cancers also don't have any known cancer-causing mutations, presumably because some cancer-causing mutations have not yet been discovered as cancer-causing. So there's probably some mutations in there. Uh, we just haven't really identified which ones they are yet. However, there has been um, a, a big breakthrough from actually a colleague, Hannah Siddle. A few years ago, she looked in particular at a particular type of gene called MHC, uh, which is involved in the immune system. So MHC, or major histocompatibility complex, uh, is actually a, a set of genes which are normally expressed on the surface of all cells, and they're important for identifying the identity of the individual. Um, so you would, for instance, have a different set of MHC genes to me, and again, different to somebody else. And actually, MHC incompatibility is the major reason for organ graft rejection. Uh, that's why usually when, uh, when doctors are setting up organ donors and recipients, they try to match them in terms of their MHC, because if they're mismatched, they're probably going to be rejected. And so what Hannah, Hannah found uh, was that although MHC genes are actually present in DFTD, um, they're there, they're quite normal looking uh, in the genome, they're not expressed, at least they're not expressed on the cell surface. So somehow there's a big block between getting this uh, MHC out of the, being transcribed and getting it to the cell surface where it serves as a kind of flag saying this is my, my, my identity. And so the fact that DFTD cells are, appear to be not expressing this MHC is a big clue as to how this cancer is likely to be able to spread uh, through the population because it's not expressing these flags which means that when it gets into another devil um, the devil has no way of identifying that it's not its own tissue. Um, and so uh, uh, it's able to kind of fly under the radar and escape detection that way. So I just wanted to uh, quickly summarize uh, where we are at the moment, the current status in terms of devil um, conservation. So devils were listed as, in, as endangered because of this disease in 2008. And at the moment, the major conservation efforts are building uh, insurance populations, which means putting devils in captivity or, or on uh, free-range enclosures or on islands uh, to keep them breeding uh, so that if a disease does wipe them out in the wild, there'll still be devils around, and in the end, they could be reintroduced into Tasmania. And this is actually the uh, one insurance program. It's an island off the east coast of Tasmania which previously didn't have any devils, and uh, this is the first animal being released onto that island. And actually, that program has been very successful. They're breeding well, um, and so that means that there's a, there's a backup plan in case the disease does cause extinction. Um, however, the devils in the wild are continuing to die from this disease, and there's a lot of research going on into potentially developing vaccines uh, or other therapies, and there's a lot of interest in understanding the evolution of this disease. So how are the... Uh, how in the, in, the, in the next few years, how will the disease spread? How will the devils respond? 
Um, is there any chance that some devils may not be as susceptible to the disease, etc.? But at the moment, sadly, there's, there's really not very much hope um, that the devils um, are doing very well at all. So just when the devils seem to be really doing very badly um, and the conservation uh, issues really becoming very, very uh, urgent, something happened which we really couldn't believe would happen, but has happened, and we don't really understand it at all. And that is that there has been the emergence of a second transmissible cancer in Tasmanian devils. So this seems like a big shock, and I'll take you through kind of how we discovered it briefly, and at the end kind of talk about what this might mean. So the story began, and I'm going to show a picture of a devil in quite a nasty state, so maybe don't look if you don't want to see the picture. So the story began with this devil, um, Red Velvet, his name was, um, who was a devil which uh, had this really quite horrible tumour on his face, which looked just like DFTD. So this picture was taken, or this devil was found down here in the southeast of Tasmania um, in 2014. And at the time, it was just thought to be another case of DFTD, just looked like a classic case. However, when colleagues brought uh, uh, chromosomes from red velvet's tumour and looked at them in the lab, they got a big shock because they found that red velvet's tumour didn't really look like DFTD. You remember how DFTD looked before? It was missing the sex chromosome, missing chromosome 2, etc. So red velvet's chromosomes actually look like pretty much a normal male devil. Um, there's the X and the Y. There's this piece on the end of chromosome 2. Um, the only real kind of changes are this piece on the end of chromosome 2 and this missing 6. Um, so that was really weird, and actually even furthermore, um, when my colleagues looked at the tissue from Red Velvet's tumour, they found that his tissue and his cells from his tumour didn't really look much like DFTD either. So you remember DFTD tends to form these kind of bundle structures which are positive for this particular thing, PRX, which is a marker for DFTD. Red Velvet's tumour just formed these kind of flat sheets of cells which didn't look much like DFTD, and furthermore, his tumour was negative for PRX, which is positive in every DFTD that's been looked at. So this was very weird, and at the time, um, we thought that this was just a very unfortunate devil, which got a tumour spontaneously, which happened to look a lot like DFTD, but actually wasn't DFTD, it was something else. Um, so that's what we believed, until um, a few weeks or a few months later, when this other devil called Snug uh, turned up, and he was uh, found about 15 kilometers from where Red Velvet was found, again with really horrible looking tumors which really looked a lot like DFTD. And the big uh, surprise came when my colleagues looked at the chromosomes from Snug's tumor, and they found, lo and behold, Snug's tumor chromosomes looked identical to Red Velvet's tumor chromosomes. You can see this bit on the end of chromosome 2, the missing 6, and the X and the Y over here. So this seemed like history was repeating itself. Um, Furthermore, Snug's tumour looked just like Red Velvet's tumour and looked nothing like uh, DFTD histologically. So at this stage, my colleagues sent some, some DNA over to us in Cambridge to do some genetic analysis. And we did the same type of genetic analysis that I showed you before using microsatellites. And just to quickly jump to the results, we found that Red Velvet and Snug's tumours, shown here and here, had um, identical genotypes to each other at every locus. Furthermore, Red Velvet and Snug's tumours were genetically different from their hosts um, in both cases, indicating that they didn't arise from their hosts. And furthermore, the most astonishing part was that Red Velvet and Snug's tumours looked nothing like DFTD, um, totally different, just as different to DFTD as Red Velvet and Snug's tumours were to any other devil in the population. So this seems to suggest that Red Velvet and Snug's tumours belong to a transmissible cancer which is not DFTD, a different transmissible cancer. But it doesn't totally rule it out that it could be an early kind of ancestral lineage derived from DFTD which diverged a long time ago, uh, maybe mutated its microsatellites and kind of ended up looking quite different. However, we were able to rule that out by looking at the sex chromosomes because as I showed you before, we know for sure that DFTD arose from a female devil the fact that Red Velvet and Snug's tumour has a Y chromosome 
is really incompatible with a common origin for the two of them. Um, so it, it's clear that these two tumours have different origins, uh, and this tumour here has contribution from a, a male devil. So we've called this, uh, this tumour devil facial tumour 2, or DFT2, and we think that it is second transmissible cancer in Tasmanian devils. And just to update you, this is a kind of very recent story. Um, at the moment, we have found um, 11 cases of DFT2 all clustered around this small peninsula, which is in the southeast of Tasmania, all within about 20 kilometers or so of each other. But presumably, the disease is, is now starting to spread out of Tasmania, and, and not that much is known, sorry, out of this peninsula, and not very much is known about it. So we have two theories as to the origin of, of DFT2. The first one is um, that simply two different transmissible cancers arose in Tasmanian devils in the last 20 or, or 25 years or so. One in a female giving rise to DFT1 and one arising in a male giving rise to DFT2. Our other theory is that perhaps DFT1 or DFT2 first arose and then at some stage infected a male host. And within this male host, this very bizarre thing happened. A, a DFTD cell and a host cell merged and merged their genetic material and rearranged it and then outgrew DFT2, which contains genetic material both from the original DFT1 and from this male individual back here. Um, I have to say that when we first discovered DFT2, uh, about 18 months ago, I thought that this was probably the more likely option, simply because it just seemed extraordinarily unlikely that two transmissible cancers would arise independently. But we now think that this is probably unlikely, and, and we believe that they are actually two different transmissible cancers which have emerged independently. So what are the implications of this for Tasmanian devils? Well, this is... I, I still really ca sometimes just can't believe that this has really happened, because... How unlikely is it, really, that you would have two transmissible cancers which are grossly indistinguishable, this is a DFT1 and this is a DFT2, arising in the same species within the span of 30 years or so? Um, I mean, the fact that we've only seen one other transmissible cancer in any other species, it just seemed incredibly, incredibly unlikely. Um, and it really seems to suggest that there's something about Tasmanian devils which makes them more vulnerable to getting this type of cancer. Uh, and we can speculate about what that might be. It might be due to the fact that they bite each other a lot around the face. Perhaps that provides a route of transmission for the disease, for a disease like this. Um, it's also possible that the fact that they're genetically inbred uh, means that they might be more vulnerable to developing this type of disease. Maybe there's some genetic factor which is inherited by Tasmanian devils which puts them more at risk of developing this particular type of cancer. Um, maybe there's something about their immune system which makes them more vulnerable to developing this type of disease. We don't yet know the answer. Um, but the other very curious thing is that no disease like this was ever observed prior to 1996. And it was really amazing to see upstairs these uh, reports from George Harris, the first reports by Europeans of Tasmanian devils back in the early 19th century. I'm sure, I, I have no doubt, that if he or other naturalists had seen Tasmanian devils with weird tumours like this, they would have reported it. And there's no report of, of anything like this before 1996. So, it seems that this type of disease is a new phenomenon in Tasmanian devils, um, which then kind of raises the question as to whether there could be some, some kind of environmental or human-related uh, reason for why this type of disease has emerged. Um, maybe something to do with the way humans are using the, the land, which is changing the devil's normal feeding or interactions or... Um, we really don't understand it, and it's just extraordinarily uh, unexpected and strange, and we're still trying to understand it. But what are the implications of DFT2 for Tasmanian devil conservation? Well, of course, the big question that jumped into many people's minds is, are insurance populations safe? Because if Tasmanian devils can give rise to, to, to transmissible cancers like this, what if the, that a transmissible cancer emerged in one of these insurance populations? Then the entire endeavor would kind of have been for nothing. 
Um, and this is really an open question. Um, how frequently would these cancers be expected to arise? And are the insurance populations actually really vulnerable to these as well? But there perhaps is one positive, at least, from the emergence of DFT2, and that is that it has accelerated or is accelerating our research um, to find the genetic factors which cause uh, transmissible cancers in Tasmanian devils. Because, because these two cancers really look pretty much identical, they probably arose via similar genetic processes. And so by searching their genomes and finding those things which are common uh, to both DFT1 and DFT2, it's quite likely that that will point us to the important genetic changes which caused the cancer in the first place. And this is something that, that we're rushing to try to do and we hope will help us perhaps to understand this more and perhaps help us to help the Tasmanian devils. So coming back to this picture here, um, so I showed you at the beginning the picture of these two transmissible cancers that we knew of. The picture has now changed, actually just in the last two years or so. We now have discovered this second transmissible cancer in Tasmanian devils, and also um, gr a group in the United States has identified five transmissible cancers affecting various species of marine bivalves, including cockles and mussels and clams, uh, all around um, the north coast of the US, uh, also in, in, in Canada, in mussels and in Spain, uh, in the Galician coast, in, in cockles and in, um, in other clams. So at least in some environments, transmissible cancers seem to be relatively common. Um, which raises the question, could transmissible cancers arise in humans? Um, maybe, for instance, transmissible cancers might be more common than we thought and are simply not detected because we hadn't really thought of looking for them before. And so could there be transmissible cancers in humans or could they arise? Um, well, I think my answer to this question is there is no evidence of a transmissible cancer in humans. Um, and I think of all the species, it's probably most likely that we would detect one in humans if it existed. Um, but that's not to say that it couldn't happen. Um, and there have been cases of cancers which have transmitted between two individuals. Um, so for instance, there's this case of a, uh, a surgeon who was operating on a, a cancer patient and he accidentally cut himself in the hand during the surgery and a few months later, he developed a tumor in the injury site, and it actually turned out to be derived from the patient. So this is a, a histolog histological image of the patient's tumor, and this is the surgeon's tumor over here. There have also been a number of, uh, of reports um, from various different uh, situations. So for instance, there have been cases of donor-derived malignancies um, following transplantation, so organ transplants, of course, organ transplants are screened incredibly rigorously, um, but there have been cases where uh, a disease or a cancerous organ has been accidentally donated and then a, a cancer has, has emerged in the recipient. Um, there have been cases of, of trans cancers transmitting between uh, during pregnancy, so for instance during mother and fetus or fetus and mother or in this case between twins in utero. Um, but really it's important to remember that these are very unusual situations and this type of thing is extraordinarily rare in human medicine and always involves some kind of strange situation. So for instance, in organ transplantation, of course, there is a strong immune um, suppression uh, uh, given to the recipient in order to prevent rejection, which might also assist with the development of, of the cancer in the recipient. So I think there are, there are examples where cancers have transmitted between two humans, uh, but no cases that have gone beyond that. And I actually think it's probably, um, it's possible, but probably quite unlikely that a cancer like this would, a trans real transmissible cancer would occur in humans. And the reason for that is that although transmissible cancers appear to be more common than we thought a few years ago, they're still really quite rare. Uh, there's still only a handful of species where we know they have occurred. And I think that kind of makes, me, makes us pause to think about why that might be the case, because we know that cancer itself arising in one individual is quite common, um, both in humans and in other animals. So 
the process of being a cancer to becoming a cancer which is able to transmit and survive beyond that host must be fairly unlikely to happen. And I think that probably is because the two things that transmissible cancers have to do over and above a cancer in one individual might be unlikely to happen. So firstly, they have to um, have a transmission route. They have to be able to actually get from one host into another host, um, which might be quite unlikely. So biting in the case of Tasmanian devils, sexual transmission in the case of dogs, probably floating through the marine environment in the case of, of these bivalves. And then the second thing that they have to do is they have to escape the immune system despite being a foreign graft. And that's probably a very, very, very difficult uh, thing for a, for a cancer to do. So in the case of DF21, we know that at least part of that is this down-regulation of MHC, which is probably a, a, a quite an unlikely thing to, to come about. Um, we don't know yet about DFT2. Uh, it seems like in, 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 in CTVT in dogs, there's also a down-regulation of MHC and we still don't even understand whether bivalves really have, a, have much of an immune system, but they probably have some defenses to protect them against this type of thing. So I think overall, uh, this transition from being a cancer in one individual to being a transmissible cancer is probably really unlikely to happen because of these bottlenecks in these two things which, which have to happen uh, both together, both of which are probably quite rare. So I don't think that we should get too concerned uh, that this type of disease would occur in humans, but um, I think it's a good thing to be aware of uh, in any case. So I'd like to finish by thanking uh, my group at, at Cambridge, the Department of Veterinary Medicine, uh, particularly my two PhD students, Max and Tim, who are here at the front uh, on this punting trip, who've done a lot of work on, on the devils on DFT1 and DFT2, and the funding bodies who support our work. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you.